The first topic has to do with uh, what's known now as plasma-induced photocatalysis. So, you know, my, mo most photocatalysis that you hear about is, involves light absorption by a semiconductor or across a band gap that absorbs the light or a homolumo gap. Here you have something very different, and I'll talk about the mechanism of it, but it's again a way to absorb light. Uh, small metal nanoparticles can absorb vis even visible light. Uh, and then you harvest that energy essentially to be able to do excited state catalysis. And of course, density functional theory has problems uh, describing excited states in terms of accuracy. Certainly, you can uh, calculate excited states with time dependency of t, but in terms of accuracy, it's, it has limitations. So we'll talk about that. And then the second topic is about electrocatalysis. And this is um, looking at essentially the, what I, what you could call the hydrogen atom of electrocatalysis, which is uh, CO2 reduction on copper. Uh, and so we'll talk about why, why that's sort of the standard um, problem uh, that, that people tend to look at. And, what, and there, of course, with electrocatalysis, you have to, to be able to describe electron transfer. And that also poses challenges for density functional theory uh, because of exchange correlation functionals. Um, so in the case of the photocatalysis, the, the excited state challenges are largely because it's a ground state theory. We don't have um, that, uh, necessarily uh, as good exchange correlation functionals as we would like to be able to describe excited states. And we certainly have that same problem with, it, with exchange correlation with respect to charge transfer because of the, um, the lack of exact exchange in, in exchange correlation uh, functionals. So, how do, so we'll talk about uh, how we overcome those for looking at CO2 reduction on copper. So, and then the third one, we use, um, uh, we, what we're looking at here is, is not actually in, in the purest sense, it's not catalysis, because in catalysis, you think of the catalyst as not changing during its process. This is what's called solar thermochemical uh, reaction, let's say it that way, but I, I put it as catalysis because in the end, the catalyst does come back to its, the, the material comes back to its original state. It's a complicated diagram. But it's basically talking about how you have you can you can take a metal oxide, and so in, in the cases that we're looking at, we're looking at transition metal oxides, which of course, as many of you may know, have, have challenges with for density functional theory. And so there we have to use um, either Hubbard corrected density functional theory, or we have to use hybrid density functional theory to be able to describe the transition metal uh, the transition metal cations um, accurately. But, and the redox uh, behavior of those, of, those, uh, uh, of those cations. But the idea is you have a transition metal oxide that you uh, expose to a concentrated solar flux that drives off oxygen. And then you're left with a reduced metal oxide, this, this metal oxide which is non straight method in general, they don't have to use it usually. And then you cool that down, um, you, you hopefully if you do this efficiently, you recuperate the heat, and you cool it down, and when you cool it down, then you can um, find an optimal uh, temperature for which you can expose it to either steam or, or CO2 and get out. Essentially what you do is re you refill, when you drive off oxygen, you, you create oxygen vacancies. And so you refill the oxygen vacancies by stripping the oxygen off of water or, or CO2 and you can make syngas that way, right? So this, this, is, this is a really interesting, and then you regenerate uh, the, the original uh, resting state of this, of this quote unquote catalyst. Anyway, it's a very interesting problem. Um, it's, a possible, it's a way to, to essentially do photocatalysis, if you like, using the entire solar spectrum, using the sunlight as, as heat. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? Well, as I, meant, as I mentioned, we go beyond DFT for the first two, for the photocatalysis on nanoparticles and, and electrocatalysis, we use a method that I've been developing in my group for a long time, and that is so-called embedded correlated wave function theory. And in its latest incarnation, which is the most accurate, we, we start by developing an embedding potential that's shown here, this is the embed, that is calculated exactly within density functional theory using the so-called density functional embedding theory. And what this allows you to do is then have, you start with your total energy in this, in this, uh, in this uh, method starts with what everyone would do, which is, a, which is when you're modeling materials, which is a periodic density functional theory calculation. So you have that energy. 
And then you have a, a kind of onion-like correction, for those of you that know that expression. It's a regional correction where we carve out a cluster on which we're going to be able to do some correlated wave function calculation. And we expose that correlated wave function to uh, that, that cluster. Uh, we modify its uh, description, its Hamiltonian, uh, by adding an so-called embedding potential, which is essentially the interaction potential between the cluster and the extended surroundings. So you have a way of taking into account the physics, the, qu the correct boundary condition of the rest of the, of the system. But you've carved out a cluster where the chemistry, in this case the catalysis, is happening. And that you treat explicitly uh, in the usual way within a correlated wave function theory. You may ask, why not just do correlated wave function theory on the entire system? It's just too expensive. There's just no, no way to, 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 to do that. And so at this point in time, anyway. Uh, and so what we do is we subtract off to avoid double counting the, the part of the DFT energy associated with the cluster subject to the embedding potential. And then we add back in this more accurate theory. So you get a regional correction that allows you to describe the excited states and charge transfer that are necessary for photoelectric catalysis to be described correctly. So the other part is with respect to the solar thermochemical, um, that's STC here, the solar thermochemical processes, what we've been doing is, I mentioned, hybrid corrected or DFT plus U, and hybrid DFT that gives you some exact exchange along with SD functional theory to be able to, to describe transition metal oxides and, and the redox reaction. And now we've coupled that for, for materials discovery with machine learning. So those are the methods that, that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, that, that we're going to be using throughout this talk. So let's start with the first one. And that is um, plasmon-induced excited state analysis, which you can now understand via this embedded correlated wave function theory. And I just want to introduce to, to those of you that aren't familiar with what, what these plasmons are, essentially what you have is you have small metal nanoparticles that are exposed to light that has a wavelength that is longer than the wavelength of the dimension of the particle. And so this cartoon sort of illustrates what happens. You have if the wavelength is longer than the dimensions of the particle, you have an electric field which can polarize the valence electrons. And it does so in a way that the valence electrons actually can move in concert with one another. They become they essentially form a collective excitation, and that's known as a surface plasmon resonance. It turns out those, so the light is absorbed, and it, whoops, the light is absorbed, and you end up with this, um, with this, uh, with this plasmon resonance that's excited, and then that plasmon resonance has a number of different decay mechanisms, in particular, some of which can be used effectively for, for catalysis. So you have this metal nanoparticle, and either it, you can have catalysis going on on the plasmonic particle, but as you'll, you'll see in a minute, that's limiting. And so you may want to attach something like a molecule or a semiconductor or metal, another metal nanoparticle that has different, different characteristics, and essentially get energy transfer um, so that the decay mechanism of this plasmon can produce, for example, hot electrons or hot holes. It can also produce heat through electron bond scattering. It can also undergo essentially a transferring an excitation to an excitation of, on, of, on one of these um, tethered uh, species uh, through resonance energy transfer. And so the problem is that um, because of all these different decay mechanisms, oftentimes it's not too efficient um, to, to do this, and so that's a challenge. And also the plasmon, the metals that actually exhibit this plasmon resonance are only the pointage metals in aluminum. So that, of course, is, as you are all experts in catalysis, you know that, yes, there is catalysis that can be done on those metals, but that's not a very large uh, palette of things to work with. And so um, when one thinks about how to, how to extend this, there are a couple of different strategies that I and uh, my group and, and my collaborators at Rice University have been using um, experimentally to, to look at these, at these systems. So, in terms of research challenges, from the experimental point of view, the problem is that you can't go in and in situ probe what's happening at the surface. I mean, that's a problem in, in many situations. Uh, and the other problem is, as I mentioned, conventional density functional theory fails in terms of accurate descriptions of excited states. So to, and as we know, for photocatalysis and electrocatalysis, we need an accurate theory to be able to describe the charge transfer and excited state reactions, and so we use this theory that I just told you about. And the strategy is one in which uh, to uh, essentially expand the palette of possibilities is to combine a plasmonic metal with a catalytic metal, either by a surface alloy, 
um, which, we'll, which I'll talk about today, or through fused metal, metal nanoparticles of different kinds, which I won't, um, I, we have other examples, but I'm not going to talk about that. These are, this is the, a set of different, of a whole variety of different um, chemistries that we've looked at for, for, for plasmonic catalysis. And I don't, you know, the only thing I'm going to talk to you about is an example having to do with converting methane and carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide to syngas, and then one in which we will look at the decomposition of ammonia um, on uh, actually the same kind of catalyst, the ruthenium doped catalyst. So here is, here is the uh, first example. And um, as I mentioned, what we're doing here is taking the two potent greenhouse gases and converting them to syngas. These are the experimental results. Um, and in this particular case, uh, and, and this is ruthenium uh, that has been proven to be on the surface, these ruthenium atoms, um, and uh, uh, doped into the surface of, of the plasmonic copper uh, nanoparticle. And then th these are the results after illumination um, for what happens when, you, uh, in terms of the amount of methane you get out as a function of time. And what you can see is copper itself is pretty awful, but as you start adding ruthenium, you get um, a, a very increased reaction rate. And the selectivity also increases up to a point and then decreases for reasons I are described in this paper. I don't have time to talk about it. The bottom line, though, is that, not surprisingly, as you can imagine, CH bond activation is rate limiting. That's, um, that's the hard part. But what's interesting is that you have different activation steps that are rate determining on pure copper versus uh, ruthenium doped copper, according to our calculations. And so this is just a, a, a little schematic of the minimum energy path for breaking the first CH bond in methane, which is the rate limiting step on pure copper. But on ruthenium doped copper, we find that it's actually the last CH step that is rate determining. And so now what I'm going to show you is a set of stacked potential curves. This is, this is essentially taking the minimum energy path and putting it into one dimension along the reaction coordinate. And then what you're seeing are excitations. These are vertical excitations. So they're, they're uh, you know, just an approximation to the, to, um, the actual excited state potential curves. But that's the best we can do at this point. And what you can see is that the barrier in the ground state is huge, two and a half electron volts. And if you, if you then excite up to the accessible um, um, excited states, you can lower the barrier, but it's still very high. And so that, that explains why, even though this is under illumination, you're just not seeing much um, um, uh, methane decomposition. On the other hand, for the, once you have ruthenium doped in, you lower the barrier a lot in the ground state, but it's still very high for, for certainly for room temperature uh, reactions. But if you excite using the plasma resonance energy, you can get up to an excited state that's accessible according to our calculations that has a much reduced barrier of 0.4 G. So you end up with a situation where you can have, um, it's both the combination of having the ruthenium, but that's not enough. But then having the illumination that allows you to get to this excited state chemistry is what allows this reaction to happen. I'll give you one more example from the this photo catalysis. And this is an example, you know, ammonia is being considered potentially as a hydrogen carrier uh, to, to essentially either first take hydrogen, make ammonia sustainably, and then use ammonia, try to transport ammonia, which is much easier to transport than hydrogen gas. Um, to where it's needed, then decompose it and re re regenerate the hydrogen gas, either for industry or for, for fuel. And so ammonia decomposition is a very important reaction to understand and, and to be able to be sustainable. So again, here's some, here's some uh, uh, experimental results looking at the N2 production rate of ammonia decomposition on ruthenium doped copper. And what's really interesting is you see that this, this is a log log plot as a function of, of ammonia pressure, and you have this, this is giving you the reaction order. The slope gives you the reaction order for the, for the log log plot. And what you see is going from thermocatalysis to photocatalysis, the reaction order changes. That immediately tells you the mechanism must be changing. But this is, what, this is the kind of data you get from the experiment. It doesn't tell you the mechanism. So we come along and we do these calculations, and these are, you know, with a lot of exquisite, exquisite detail. This is showing um, the, the, the potential energy curve, again, in, in, along the reaction coordinate for the, for the two rate limiting steps, and we look at all of them, but these are the, the most important steps, which is breaking the NH bond in ammonia, as well as forming the N2 bond, so getting the nitrogen atoms off the surface. And so we have, the, again, the stacked potential energy curve, 
And what you can see in the ground state, so the lowest energy state is what you get in the dark. You have a, you have a high barrier um, for breaking the NH, uh, NH bond, but you have an even higher barrier for getting the nitrogen off the surface. And so if we look at that and think about the thermocatalysis then, essentially what you, what you have, this is just summarizing what you see here, a 1.4 EV barrier for breaking the first NH bond, and a 2.8 EV barrier for, for getting the nitrogen off the surface. So the rate limiting step is getting the nitrogen off the surface. And so that's why you see in, in the experiment zero thoracogenic with respect to ammonia. It's not important. It doesn't, it doesn't determine um, the, the M2 production range. Likewise, if we go to the photocatalysis and we look at what, what, is, what are the accessible, with the plasma energy, what is the accessible set of, um, of excited states, and what are the potential energy surfaces that they can access in the excited state manifold. And what you can see is that for ammonia um, uh, breaking the first NH bond, you can get, you can reduce the barrier a bit, reduces to about one EV. And then, but if you look at the same, uh, ask the same question for getting nitrogen off the surface, the lowest barrier we can find is about 0.6 EV. And so what you see is kind of a reversal of the rate, rate limiting step. So the rate limiting step in this case in the excited state is breaking the NH bond in ammonia. And that's why it's first order with respect to ammonia. So we can do these kinds of simulations now that allow us to help the, the experimentalists understand what's really going on in the kinetics. Okay, so probably many of you already know about the fact that, that um, if you look at this as a, a you know, there's a famous review article by Corey that, that talks about um, you know, looking at the entire periodic table and saying which one of these metals acting as, a, as an electrode, uh, as, a, as a cathode, can actually reduce CO2 to something beyond a C1 product. And the only one that can do that is copper. And so this is, this is a, a plot of showing the, um, the, uh, uh, the products that come out. And you see that hydrogen dominates. And that's, you know, the name of the game in CO2 reduction is to, is to basically figure out a catalyst that doesn't just produce hydrogen, right? That produces higher order um, um, C2 and beyond products. So there's been a lot of work then done on copper uh, by uh, computation, by DFT. And, it's, and, and that, I, I view that as a, as a very important foundational set of, of studies for the work that we subsequently have done. The problem with DFT is that, you know, if you think about it, this PCBT, proton coupled electron transfer, again, you have the problem that density functional theory does not describe electron transfer as accurately as you would like. But in addition, there's a very thing, you know, there's a, there's a well-known problem for CO, uh, because, because basically one thing that's really important to know about CO2 reduction on copper is that the rate of the step is not actually CO2 reduction, it's CO reduction. So it would be good to be able to describe CO correctly on the surface, and it turns out that CO is not described correctly uh, by DFT, that is in terms of even just the ad site for CO. Um, experimentally, it's known to be on top, whereas um, DFT predicts it to be in a threefold hollow site. So that's kind of sad. You can't even get the structure right. Um, we showed a long time ago, 14 years ago, that, um, that our ECW theory, a different incarnation of it, predictably is able to predict that the CO ad site is in fact a top and not um, on, on the hollow site. And so we recently decided to say, okay, we can get the structure right. Presumably that may, may set us up to, to be able to describe the kinetics right, the thermodynamics and kinetics. So we decided to revisit electrochemical CO2 reduction reactions via this ECW theory because we know that it also should be able to describe charge density correctly. So, um, so what we did was to look at the two mechanisms that people have been looking at with the MT, which is either Absorbed hydrogen transfer, so hydrogen transfer, so this is sitting on the surface already, it's already, you know, you take the protons in solution and then reduce and form hydrogen on the surface. And now the hydrogen can transfer um, to CO to form four meal or to form uh, 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 hydroxy methylidine. And, uh, and, and, or to go by proton coupled electron transfer on copper one. And as I said before, CO reduction is rate limiting, so that's what we want to look at. So we wanted to compare formation of CHO formula or hydroxyphilidine COH, first via hydrogen transfer. And this is just showing you um, the CHO path uh, for uh, um, 
uh, uh, for hydrogen transfer. This is showing you actually what the embedding potential looks like for fun. And, uh, and then for the COH path, um, we followed the work of, of, of earlier investigators that showed that the lowest energy path actually goes through a, hydro, a, hydro, a proton shuttle, if you like, there. And so there's a help of water. So we're following that path uh, as well in, in our calculation. But then also comparing for PCET, now what we need to do is really describe solvated protons properly. And there you need to have an explicit use of solvated proton, namely at least an ion cation. So this is a, this is a larger cluster with an ion cation. That is forming um, uh, CHO and then COH. So, in, in these calculations, in all these quantum calculations in general, uh, you model these reactions initially with charge that is conserved throughout the reaction, because that's how you know, Hamiltonian is defined with a certain number of electrons. Um, but of course, the actual electrode is held at constant potential, not at constant charge. And so what we do is we adopt uh, a simple, but it works extremely well for our systems, uh, a mo model of um, Karen Chan and Jim Schwarzkopf, namely a capacitor model, that allows you for, for metal surfaces to uh, convert constant charge to constant potential kinetics. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is the results from, from having done that transformation. And what we're going to use is a validation metric as to, as to which theory uh, gives a proper description and, and, and what we think we can trust, is to note that on top of one one the reaction happens uh, mostly or um, really doesn't turn on until you have an applied potential that's at least minus 0.9 volts. So as I said, what we're going to do is look at, in this case, I'm just going to look at the activation free energy. Um, for these four paths. So paths are going to COH or CHO and either by hydrogen transfer or by um, or by hydrogen transfer or by PCET over a range of the wide of applied potential. And here's the results you get from standard density functional theory, V of PPE. And so what you see here is that um, as a function, first of all, the horizontal lines are the hydrogen transfer because they don't depend on potential. There's no electron. But with PCET, you can, you can tailor the electron energy, right, um, by applied potential, and that's what changes these, uh, these, uh, these activations. So applying activation energy is a function of applied potential. But what you can see is the lowest energy case says that we should make absorbed hydroxyhydrolidine by PCET. But what you see also is that you can get to below 0.5 volts at a very low, a very uh, near zero applied potential, negative potential. And that's just not consistent with the experiment, okay? And, then, and you know, essentially, it, it should be that, that you have a reasonably high barrier until you get closer to minus 0.1 volts. And here's what you get from, EC, from the ECW theory. You see something much, much more akin to that. So that if effectively, the, low, the lowest energy activation barrier, activation free energy, doesn't get to around 0.5 volts until just about minus 1 volt, minus 0.9 volts. That's, that's interesting in and of itself. It says that it's consistent with experiment. But the other thing that's important is that it predicts something different than DFT. Okay? In particular, by describing for the quantum um, exchange and correlation to describe charge transfer correctly by having exact exchange um, incorporated appropriately. Um, then, essentially, you, what you see is that you have two competing mechanisms for PCET to form both of these products. So DFT qualitatively just says you should only make COH on proper one on one. In fact, our, our calculations suggest no, you should get formula and you should get COH. And it, it is, uh, um, and with a barrier that really suggests you only should see it much closer to minus 0.9 volts. So only this ECW theory is consistent with the experiment. And it, it's important to see that it predicts different products than DFT, which is going to affect subsequent CC coupling and, and methane formation mechanisms. But now you have to consider both of those intermediates. So we conclude that really one needs to use this ECW theory whenever you have electron transfer. If you have processes that don't involve electron transfer, so if they're just, for example, CC coupling steps, DFT does a pretty good job. You don't need to worry about it, but you should worry about it if you, if you want to describe electron transfer. 
So um, we, we have now, uh, we, we have started looking at CC bond formation mechanisms on copper 101 and 0 and actually twin copper. And as I've said, you know, both of these are equally favorable. And so it means it really complicates the mechanism. It means that you have to look at all these different processes. You have to look at COH coupling with CO and CHO. And, and so we've actually looked at all of these different mechanisms and have determined um, uh, what, which, CC, what, which C2 products are the most likely to occur on the way to nothing. Okay. Um, in the last uh, few minutes, I'm going to uh, um, uh, talk to you about solar thermochemical hydrogen production in particular. I mean, one can also make CO, but in this particular case, um, what I've got illustrated here is, is, is for hydrogen production. And, um, and the point is, as I mentioned, just to remind those of you um, uh, that, that are less familiar with this, you start out with a, with a metal oxide, typically a transition metal oxide. And it, there's a whole variety of ones that have been tried. Uh, and what you do is you, you use a concentrated solar flux. You heat it up to quite very high temperatures, typically under um, near vacuum, um, well, small amounts of, of, of oxygen present, to be able to, to drive off oxygen. You now make this reduced metal oxide that has oxygen vacancies. And those oxygen vacancies um, essentially then, when they're exposed to steam at a lower temperature, typically um, in this temperature range, can essentially strip the oxygen from the steam and make hydrogen. And so um, the, right now, the state of the art uh, material is ceria, so cerium dioxide. And uh, there's been a lot of work looking at, can we come up with, because it, it's still not very efficient, it doesn't have the optimal uh, range, actually, of the um, enthalpy of reduction. And so we'd like to find a way to tune that enthalpy of reduction, and actually the entropy of reduction, to be able to get it to a sweet spot for this kind of recycling. And, uh, and so, um, actually, metal oxide peroxides are being explored by a number of groups um, as, as new candidates. And the nice thing about peroxides is you have both an A site and an A site, an ABO3. So you can potentially tune this enthalpy reduction, which is effectively the oxi uh, oxygen vacancy formation energy. Um, and then the question is one of the things we were interested in is whether or not, in addition to tuning that enthalpy reduction, can you also make the A site uh, essentially uh, reducible? Because in general, uh, the, the kinds of elements that are used on the A site tend to be non-redox active. And that means you end up with a loss of entropy of reduction. Just think about the configurational entropy of different cations with different oxidation states leading to a higher entropy of reduction, which could, could, could be a driving force. So we want to be able to tune both of those. And so that is, that's what we set out to do several years ago. And we, we did a, a lot of screening, and we came up with, actually, a material which seemed promising, apparent material which seemed promising. Namely, it has a vacancy formation energy which is a bit lower in, in an optimal range that one can derive from dynamically, um, and it's quite a bit lower than Syria. And we had evidence based on looking at density of states this is the pristine material, and here is the defect, the material with oxygen vacancy. And you can see that these cerium F states, right above the Fermi level, in fact, move down and become occupied. And there's actually a little bit, too, of the manganese D that becomes occupied as well. And so this was some evidence from the density of states that we were getting simultaneous reduction, and at the same time, which is what we want for um, an improved entropy of reduction. Here you can also see the same kind of information by looking at a density difference plot, where we're looking at the densities with and without the oxygen vacancy. And so here is the oxygen vacancy in gray, and you can see it in this really quite beautiful, I just love seeing, seeing this, that you have this manganese where you can see the electrons going into a D orbital, there's the four lobes, and into the cerium F orbital here. Um, and so um, we, we, we thought that that was a, a, a useful parent material. In fact, we're working with people at, at NREL um, who, are, who, are, uh, who began to test this idea. But at the same time, we also decided to do high throughput screening, which is you know, the flavor of, of, the, of the decade, I guess, right now. And, um, 
And so we, we uh, looked at all the first row transition metals for B sites, and we looked at alkaline earths and some lanthanides for A sites, looked at all these different, uh, different crystal systems, and came up with a, with a data set that has, all, that has these properties. Okay? So 341 unique oxygen vacancy sites, um, and you know, over 200 composition structure combinations, a mixture of insulating and metallic perovskites. Out of that came a model. That, so we did some very simple, this is not, not complicated machine learning, okay? This is, this is a, a, sim, a simple um, uh, uh, linear regression uh, type of, 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 uh, of fitting, okay? But what we did was to come up with a model that, unlike you know, a, a lot of machine learning models, which frankly bothered me because, I, because you don't have intuition, they're just, you, you end up with these terms that you don't know how to, at least I don't know how to interpret them. The beauty of this model is it's a very simple model based on physical properties some that could, in principle, either be measured or, or be calculated easily. And they have to do with, with just thinking about the physics of the, um, of, of the process of making a vacancy. So here, we have a monster. We have a um, we have to break, in, when we make an oxygen vacancy, we have to break the metal oxygen bond. So we have a crystal bond dissociation energy in the model. Of course, that oxide, it, taking out the o, O2 minus, you leave behind the two electrons that came from that O2 minus. So there's a crystal reduction potential part, so the, 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 the crystal is being reduced. And then the extent of delocalization, if it's a metal versus a, versus a semiconductor, makes a difference, um, as it turns out. Um, for reasons I clearly don't have time to describe. The stability makes a difference, and we can come up with, a, with a, essentially a born hopper cycle that allows you to derive this. And as a result, some um, new candidates have come out, one of which seems, which has now been proven to cycle and to, to produce hydrogen, seems to produce it, uh, be very promising as a potential replacement for Syria. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip this slide and go straight to the acknowledgement so we have time for the question. And just want to thank, um, again, my group, which is shown here. Last time we were all physically in, in, in contact with one another. Um, my senior collaborators at Rice, at UCSB, at ASU, um, and the members of my group, and the Air Force and the DOE, and you for your attention. is a study, a uh, three-year congressional mandated study on CO2 utilization right now. Yeah. And, you know, I think the point is that the electrocatalysis and the photocatalysis approaches are still at what we call technology readiness levels that are way too, that are way too low. We're not, they're not really ready for prime time. That doesn't mean that, that we should stop working on them, right? I mean, they'll never be ready unless we work on them. So, I think that we're still quite a long ways off from being able to utilize them. I personally have come to the conclusion that, you know, if we can do it through ele electrocatalysis, it's probably better than photocatalysis. Uh, and um, I can have a long conversation with you about that uh, at some point as to why. That's my basic opinion. I just think that, that um, we can generate, you know, we can, if we can use excess zero carbon emission electricity, that's critical. Notice I don't say renewable, it can be renewable, but it could be nuclear. Um, and if we can do that, uh, then, you know, ele electrical processes are just much more efficient. Um, you know, the electrical work is much more efficient. So. Okay, quick question over here. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. So I have a question in the first part. Basically, in both of your examples, either the reaction of product or the physical of species, whether it is safe for all and two, and it's very difficult to calculate entropy as well as physical of and barriers for these species. So, do you have any comments on how uh, they, they induce effect field would affect 
Oh, did you select the field for the plasma? Is that what you think? Is that what you're asking about? Or are you asking on the surface of the site? For which system? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, it doesn't seem that, that um, I don't think, okay, it's a good question. I, we, we have not evaluated whether or not the electric field um, dramatically affects these states. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Thank you. We'll have to think about it. I don't expect it to make a big difference, but it's worth looking at. audience to say that they shouldn't, you know, pay attention to DFT. I think uh, DFT, as I said, is really good uh, for, um, so let's just say that the difference in energy between the hollow site and the contract site is not huge. And, and so it's, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Z. It's hard to get that level of accuracy. So to be fair, that's, that's, a, that's part of the problem, right? Um, and so if you want qualitatively correct results for cases in which you don't have electron transfer, you're not looking at excited states, I think DFT tends to work okay. It'll, it'll be okay. Um, and I think if you're working with semiconductors or you're working with insulators, hybrid DFT is better than pure DFT. But you should not be using hybrid DFT to study a metal, okay, because of, you know, the, the it's just still founded because the um, the mixture of partial shock exchange, okay, exact exchange, for into for hybrid DFT, partial shock exchange for metal diverges at the family level, and you get all sorts of spurious effects, charge charge uh, density waves and things like that. So you can't. But so what we do is when we do pure DFT. You know, we, we use pure DFT for metals as a starting point. But for example, because the sites are wrong, we re-optimize using embedded correlated wave function theory the, the structures. Okay, we we choose the structures that embedded correlated wave function theory finds to be the, the ground state. Okay, not what DFT finds for CO down to the metal. I think that's what.